So welcome to the course today. We are looking today into the base filter and we'll revisit some of the um, basic concepts behind um, base filters and then we'll look also into the extended Kalman filter or Kalman filter and extended Kalman filter as one way of implementing or realizing a base filter um, that is frequently used or has been frequently used in um, the context of the simultaneous localization and mapping problem. Okay, first, so in general, so the, the first hour today covers topics that had been addressed in the introduction to mobile robotics course. Um, and then in the second part of the lecture today, we'll dive into the extended common filter and extended common filter. Some of you may have seen that, but I'll try to give kind of a complete picture of that common filter algorithm so that you can then next week, um, we can even go more in more detail and realize a slime system using an extended common filter and that we also, will also be part of the homework assignments, uh, which will probably uh, come out next week or in two weeks. So just to put that into perspective or into context what we are doing here. The um, base filter is one technique to do state estimation. So um, we have data, we have typically sensor observation, and we have control data. That means we have sent commands to the robot, that's what is expressed by U over here, and we have observations which are expressed by Z over here. And we want to estimate the state of our system, whatever that state is. Could be the position of the robot in the environment, could be the position of a landmark, it could be the state of a door, if a door is open or closed. It could be anything we want to estimate and we, which we can perceive and then we can potentially modify by executing any action. So it's kind of a general framework for state estimation and the overall goal is to estimate that posterior. So this is the state of the world X given our sensor data and our controls. Kind of all what this state estimation is about. So if you don't know anything about the world, we start with a uni uniform distribution. That means every state um, is, has, has the same likelihood if you don't know anything. And as we acquire observation and as we execute actions, we get more certain about the state. And so hopefully in the end, we'll have a very, very peak distribution around one state, which is hopefully the correct state. Again, we can never say the system is exactly in that particular state because we have a probability distribution here. So we only get distributions, but typically we can say the mean estimate is whatever uh, the state is in a, uh, the world is in a certain state. That's something we can do. And um, as the name base filter suggests, we are trying to estimate this posterior here using base rule and um, some other um, rules from probability theory to come up with an equation, in this case a recursive equation, um, that allows us, to uh, allows us to integrate one observation and one control at a time and recursively estimates the current state of the system. Okay, so the current state of the system is often um, also defined as the belief, the belief about xt, so the small index t here refers to the, um, to the current time step t. And this is exactly the probability distribution about xt given a sequence of sensor observations and a sequence of commands. The sequence is expressed here by this 1 to t and u 1 to t. So we have t sensor observations and t controls that have been executed. So we have a sequence and we want to estimate the current state of our system. So this is just the definition. Now let's apply Bayes' rule to x, uh, xt and that t. So we kind of want to swap those two variables and this um, Bayes' rule tells us how to do that. So if you have p of a given b is the same than p of, p, uh, p of b given a times p of a divided by p of b. So it's a standard application of Bayes' rule. And if we apply Bayes' rule, we end up with this equation over here. So what we have done in here is we swapped xt and that t. So that t is now sitting here and xt moved over here. It's kind of the only change we did in this part. Then we have the, the second term um, which is p of x t given all variables but not z t and the, this is the normalizer, uh, the normalizing term which we are not interested here in estimating um, so we, it's just written in this compact form with a normalizer. So this is just the basic uh, ex um, execution of base rule, nothing else has happened here. Just base rule executed. Okay, <clears throat> so then we can actually look to the first term over here, this first um, distribution. 
And um, we can we say if we want to know what's the probability of obtaining a certain measurement, Zt. And given that we know the state of the world, we can ignore all the previous measurements and all the previous commands we have executed. There's something which is called the Markov assumption. So given you know the state of the world, you can forget about what happened in the past. And that means we can actually get rid of these observations over here and these controls over here. Again, this is an assumption. It doesn't necessarily have to be the case, but it's kind of a standard assumption which has been done. Given you know the state of the world, you can actually estimate um, uh, the probability distribution over the current observation. So if you have some sensor with a bias or you have an error on your a systematic error in your sensor measurements, the previous sensor information may help you to get a better, get a better estimate of this distribution. But that's something which is ignored here. So we really say it's an assumption. Given we know the state of the world, we actually can get rid of the past observations and the controls executed. So this term dramatically simplifies to this term over here. So everything uh, which has this red bar over here is kind of the, the quantity that has changed. Um, so this expression over here turns into this expression. The rest is left unchanged. OK, so let's have a look to the second term over here. This is, um, we want to estimate the current state of the system given the past observations up to the time step t minus 1. So we're missing the last observation. But all commands executed. It's like having an estimate up to time t minus 1 <coughs> plus executing a motion command. And therefore, we expand this term over here using the law of total probability. We introduce a new variable, xt minus 1, which should represent to the state of the system at the previous time step. We can introduce this easily using the um, law of total probability. So this guy here will turn into an integral over the same variable xt. The same is, these quantities are exactly the same um, than down here except we have this additional newly introduced variable xt minus 1 and we integrate over this variable xt minus 1 and then have to take this term over here times the likelihood that this um, variable occurs given the same um, information we had before. So we introduce a new variable and we, we integrate over this whole variable so the expression will be, stay exactly the same. So it's again just the application of the law of total probability. Any question about this law of total probability? Or is this clear to everyone? Mostly. Mostly. OK. Um, maybe we can just write it down on the blackboard uh, with less variables. Maybe it becomes clearer. So if I have a distribution about a variable p of a, the law of total probability says we can introduce a new variable, b, another event, and say, um, we're interested in P of A given B times the likelihood that this event occurs and we want to integrate over all possible Bs. That means, so, D, B. so what, it, what that means is if you want to have the probability distribution about a variable A, we can say, okay, how likely is it that if A occurs given that we know an additional term B, that the likelihood that B takes this value and I integrate over all, the, all possible outcomes of B. So if you write it for the discrete case, it may be uh, easier to see. So you sum over all Bs, P of A given B times the rest stays exactly the same, P of B. So we, we sum over all potential values that B can have, say what's the likelihood that this value occurs, and what is P of A given this value of B. And if we do that for all possible values of B, we end up getting exactly P of A. This is what's called law of total probability. So this is for the continuous case and for the discrete case. Ah. So if you have a discrete random variable, you have to sum of all possible outcomes. If you have a continuous variable, you cannot enumerate all of them. Yeah. Then you have to use the integral. <coughs> Okay, so just the application of the um, law of total probability. And then we look again to this first term over here. 
And again, we apply the Markov assumption that we used before in a very similar setting, saying if you're interested in estimating the current state of, this, of the world, and given we know the previous step of the world, everything else we have seen or done before that time stand is not interesting to us. So we actually can get rid of all the observations which were sitting here in all the commands except the last one, because ut is executed um, to go, come, go from xt minus 1 to xt. So this tells me something in how the state of the system should evolve from time step t minus 1 to t. So this we need to maintain. So ut uh, needs to maintain. All the rest can go away according to the Markov assumption. So um, this equation over here simplifies to this equation over here. And this is just a term which says, given the, for example, if you estimate the state of the robot, given I know where the robot is at time x t minus 1, uh, t minus 1 and it executes the motion commands ut, for example, go a meter forward, go one meter forward, I can have a probability estim uh, um, estimate about the position of the robot at the current point in time, which is somewhere around my predicted pose. That's exactly what this term tells me over here. Yes, please. And in line two, you use the same mark assumption, but you got rid of all the use from line two to line three. Um, from line two, so from here to here. Yeah. Okay, so, um, Exactly, because here we were knowing this, the known state was xt. And here the known state is xt minus 1. And therefore I can only get rid of up to the state, I'm, I'm, I, I, the state I know. Okay. So if I, if, I, if I know a state and I do something in the future, this may help me to estimate my future yeah, state. Nice. But nothing which has happened in the past or up to that time step. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Um, and the next thing we do with another Markov assumption, this recursive term down here. Um, or it's actually an independence assumption, saying if you want to estimate the state at xt minus 1, we care, and we don't know any previous state, we care about all the observations and all the controls except the control command which has been executed in the future. So if I say, if I want to estimate the, um, the state of my system up to the previous time step, I don't care which command the, the system executed in the future. This is obviously, again, an assumption. This is not necessarily true. If you can think about a robot which goes just, drives just forward and xt is the position of the robot. Um, if, I know, if, if, my, if I have two states the system can be in, so I'd say one state is this state over here and the other state is this state over here. This is my, my bimodal belief. And if I, t if I know that the next motion command is go one meter forward, it's quite likely that I'm not in this state because it will lead to a collision. It's more likely that I was in this state. So knowing what the system executes in the future can, under certain circumstances, allow you to make a better prediction. But this is something which is ignored here. So it's really an in, uh, assumption that you assume. I, I ignore that. I assume that the, the motion command execute in the future doesn't tell me anything about the state at the previous point in time. But again, this is an assumption. It's, it's, it's not bad to make an assumption. We only need to be aware of those assumptions. So if something breaks or fails later on, we may revisit our assumptions and say, hmm, is this assumption perhaps, was this assumption not justified? Okay, and then if you look to this term now over here, this term looks very, very similar to the term we had in the beginning, except that the index t, minus, t is replaced by t minus 1. So it's kind of a recursive term. This is just... The, this guy here is a belief of the system at the time step t minus 1. So I can just rewrite that and express this as the belief of the system at the previous point in time. Okay, so what we have now, so it's an important thing, we have an, a recursive update scheme which allows us to estimate the state of the system based on the uh, previous state, um, the current motion command ut, and the current observation zt. That means we have, if we have a probability distribution about what this, in which state the system was in previously, and we execute a motion command and we obtain a sensor observation, we can actually compute the state of the system at the new point in time. And this is exactly what the base filter does. So it's a recursive update scheme which allows you to update your probability distribution based on a command that the system executed and the observation that the system obtained. Yes, please. <coughs> so when we calculate that, do we do that online so that the belief x t minus 1 is just the uh, uh, value? Or do we uh, 
calculate uh, recursively? So we, we, could, we could do both. Typically, it's used in an online fashion. That's kind of the key advantage of the, or one of the advantages of the base filter. That if you say, given I specify the, the distribution at the point in t, uh, t0, so I, I say, okay, the robot starts here. Or I have no idea where the system starts, I have a uniform distribution. Whatever it is, it's kind of your initial belief. And then once you get an observation, once you get a reading, you can estimate the time t1 given your knowledge about t0. And then if the next observation and, send, and command um, is obtained, then you can compute the state at the point in time t2 given t1. So you really use that in an online fashion. As soon as data comes in, you can estimate the next, the next step. Because in order to estimate this guy over here, you don't, don't need any information about the future. That's kind of the key thing. So um, to estimate that, you don't need any observation or sender command that is obtained in the future. Of course, in theory, we would have to. That was our independence assumption. But under this independence assumption, um, as this term doesn't uh, include any future sense observation, any future commands, um, we can use this as an online fashion. If there would be future observations in here, we could not use this in an online fashion because what I measure in the future influences my current state. Again, this is an independence assumption that the base filter does, but given this independence assumption, it's a powerful tool for doing online state estimation. Any further questions about that? Okay, great. Therefore, you find also the base filter often written in, in two ways, in a prediction step and a correction step. The prediction step takes into account the command which was executed, and the correction step takes into account the sensor observation. And the predicted belief is always the belief, often the belief with a bar over here. Um, and this is just how do I go, given I know xt minus 1, how do I estimate xt given xt minus 1? And I need to integrate it because I don't know exactly what uh, the system was at time t minus 1. This is the probability distribution, so I kind of need to integrate about all possible states the system can be in at the previous point in time, and then can compute where the system will end up with. Um, this is the prediction step, and then we have the correction step, which says, okay, given my, my, my predicted belief, I can now take into account my sensor observation to um, um, increase, for example, the likelihoods of the states which are in line with my sensor observation. And then we have the normalizing term that um, all possible, the, the sum of all possible states or the integral of all possible states needs to sum up to one or integrate up to one. That's kind of what this normalizer is about. Okay, and if you now look to, these two, to this term over here and this two term more carefully, we can see that that's actually something we call the motion model. It tells us how does a system evolve from time step t minus 1 to t given an executed command. That's the motion model or the process model. And we have the correction step, which tells you what's the likelihood of an observation given the system is in a certain state. But given I know the state, what's the likelihood of that observation? And this is often called the sensor model or the observation model. And we briefly talked about those models before. I will dive a little bit more into the details here or give a few examples of how those model, these models could look like um, so that you kind of understand how we use the sensor model and the motion model in the course, uh, during this course uh, in order to estimate the belief xt. So in the context of SLAM, xt here would be, the, for example, the position of the robot and the location of all landmarks or whatever map representation I use. If I would use localization only, this would be just the position of the pose of the robot. And it's important to note that the base filter is just kind of a general framework for doing recursive state estimation, but it doesn't tell us which technique we should use to actually compute those integrals, what kind of underlying assumptions we, sh we should make about the distribution. For example, if I say, um, I, I want to use only Gaussian distributions because I know something about the, estimate, uh, the quantity I want to estimate, then it makes sense to use a particular variant of the base filter which is explicitly made for Gaussian distributions because it will be more um, efficient and more effective than a filter which takes into account general distributions if I know that everything is Gaussian or how the um, motion model or the observation looks like. Are these, can I express these guys as linear functions or nonlinear functions? All these, um, the properties of the system um, influence what kind of implementation of base filter I actually need. 
And so there are different ways, large number of different ways. We will mainly look into two variants of the uh, base filter. The one is the common filter family, and the other one is the particle filter uh, family. So it's family because there are more than one algorithm. There's more than one common filter algorithm. There's more than one particle filter algorithm. And they mainly differ in the models they allow us to, allow us to use in the terms of linear motion model, nonlinear motion model, um, and the same for the, uh, for the sensor model, or what kind of underlying assumptions they do about the distribution. So are they Gaussian? Are they non-Gaussian? Do I use a parametric form, like a Gaussian distribution, which I can specify with the mean and the variance? Or are these non-parametric distributions where there's no kind of closed form uh, or no kind of... Um, a way to describe this function with a limited number of parameters, so I may need sample or sampling techniques in order to estimate the, uh, or represent the full distribution. So as I said, we will look into common filters. Common filters require Gaussian distributions, and they require also linear or linearized um, motion models and observation models. And we will look into particle filters, which is a non-parametric way, which allows us to have more or less arbitrary models. So in this sense, this is, you can see that it's a more general filter. You can handle cases that the common filter cannot handle. If, however, the world is in line with the assumption that the common filter does, the common filter is a better estimator. So there's, kind of, there's no free lunch. Um, either, it, it depends really on, on what your problem is. If you, have, if you really have a problem that fits the assumption of the common filter, that's the optimal estimator. You can't do better. But if you have whatever highly nonlinear motion, and motion with a mobile robot is often nonlinear because there are angles involved, so it means you have sine and cosine functions in there, which are nonlinear functions. So the assumption of having linear models is often violated, depending on how your system is built, but often it is violated. And therefore, common fil particle filters are often kind of more robust because they can handle those cases better, but come often at an increased computational cost. Okay, so let's look into those models. And we'll actually look into uh, common filters and particle filters in more detail in this course. We'll start with the common filter um, today because it's the first technique we start with. Um, so this was just kind of the general base filter framework. And in the next lecture, um, we will actually dive into the details, into the specific implementations of those filters. Okay, let's have a look at the motion model again. So there was kind of, um, how do I estimate the current state of the system if I know the previous one and the command which was executed. So let's look into robot motion. Um, so if we have a robot that moves around in the environment, the motion is inherently uncertain because the robot m typically makes mistakes. If I tell my, motor, my robot, go a meter forward, it will actually give power to the motors, let the motors drive, and if they think, okay, now I made a certain number of rotations, I will stop that now because that's a meter. But quite likely it's a meter and whatever, two centimeters or 99 centimeters. So it's quite, li quite likely that we don't end up exactly in the command we executed. And the question is how can we model this motion? Just to give you an example, so this is a trajectory of a robot through a maze environment. And this is kind of the corrected trajectory where the robot was driving. Um, and so it kind of it was started over here and it went down here, goes here through that maze. And um, if you just take into, a, so integrate our odometry information, so counting the revolution of the wheels and saying, assuming that there's no uncertainty, we'll actually end up with a trajectory which looks like this. So you can see here the system has a slight drift to the right and going down here. So it goes slightly to the right. You can see again a slight drift to the right. It's very small, but it accumula accumulates over time. So if I just integrate the trajectory of the system into actually looks like this, Although you can say it has kind of a similar shape, it's definitely not the right trajectory that the robot took. So how can we specify that? How do we go from a state x to a state x prime or from xt minus 1 to xt given a command? And in robotics, we typically have two different models that we use, at least in kind of wheeled robotics. That's mainly what we focus in here. Um, in, we have two different kind of models. Uh, that we often use. The one is the so-called odometry-based model. And the odometry assumes we have wheel encoders. So we have something attached to the wheels which count the revolution of the wheels. And this gives me a pretty good estimate of where, I, where the robot is going. 
Why it may be inaccurate? Because maybe one wheel is slightly bigger than the other one. Let's say our air uh, wheels with air pressure. Let's say the pressure in one wheel is slightly smaller than the other wheel. This will, turn to, uh, will result in slight drift. Or you're driving on uneven ground, whatever it is. So it introduces some small errors. But the odometry model is kind of to be the, the, the easier to handle model. The other model is the velocity-based model. The velocity-based model assumes that we don't have those encoders. So we can't count the revolution of the wheels, but I, I send velocity commands to the system, and then I will actually assume that the system followed these velocity commands. So these things are more likely to be used in, for example, flying vehicles, where it's pretty difficult to use an encoder, because the things are flying in the air. Or if you have humanoid robots which are walking, or um, robots with legs, they may have encoders in their joints, but you never know how big the stab is that the system is currently taking by, for example, walking. And those systems often um, use a velocity or velocity-like uh, model. So if we have odometry encoders, let's lose the, we should use the odometry model. And that's actually, in most wheeled robots, the case. Or we have to stick with the velocity-based model. The odometry-based model I briefly shown last uh, week. So we assume this is a system at the point in time, whatever, t minus 1 or t, and we go to t or t plus 1, depending on my notation, and the question is where do I will end up? And we can express this motion, with, which is a robot which lives in the 2D plane, so it has a x-coordinate, y-coordinate, and an orientation theta, and it can only drive along its orientation. Then we can express this by one rotation, so this should be the heading of the robot, so this is the first rotation. Then by going along a straight line to this new pose and then doing a second rotation. It's one way for describing that. There are other ways for describing that. I could also say, okay, the robot goes forward with its current orientation, so it would go down somewhere here. Then it moves to the side and then it rotates. It's something which is called the forward sideward rotate model. And this is kind of rotation translation rotation model. There are different ways for expressing that, but that's kind of one of the commonly used ones. And given I have this pose over here, given I have this pose over here, I can actually compute those parameters. That's what you can see here. But I can also do it the other way around. If I have um, the pose, I can execute the first rotation, translate the system forward, and then do a second rotation. Then I can compute this pose over here. So whatever I have, I can compute the other one. And the math here is, is, is actually not too difficult. So um, the distance between the centers of rotation of the robots is just the Euclidean distance between this guy here over this and this guy over here. This gives me this distance. And um, the first rotation is given by um, kind of the a, the a ton, arcus tangens, um, between those two poses, which is kind of, if you put that triangle over here, it's kind of this angle of the triangle. This is the first part over here. So this part. And then we have to subtract the orientation that the system currently has. It's just kind of first kind of, you can see that it's first rotate to the, in the direction of the x-axis, and then rotate to this orientation, move forward, and then do the final rotation that's, that's, that's missing. If we want to introduce noise, or if we, we need to typically make an assumption what kind of noise um, is introduced to that system. And the standard choice in here is to assume a Gaussian error in these individual three components. So I say, while doing the first rotation, the robot makes an error. While traveling forward, the robot makes an error. And while doing the second rotation, the robot makes an error. If we have that, we can express it in this way. Say, OK, this is an error. We assume it to be Gaussian. It does an error while going forward. This is assumed to be Gaussian. And we have an um, error in this second rotation over here. So we assume we have um, a Gaussian error on the odometry command. The command would be here, um, rot first rotation, translation, second rotation. This, however, doesn't lead to a Gaussian error or a Gaussian belief about whether, where the system is in this state given this state, because we have nonlinear function in here. So if we can kind of show how this looks like, for different noise parameters, I can get different kinds of distributions. So kind of the darker it is over here, the more likely the state. And you can see here, this is a system which has an error in the translation and in the rotation. In contrast, to this case, the distribution looks like this. It typically means the system is actually pretty good in, in, in rotating, but um, the translation uh, is very noisy. So kind of the, the main uncertainty is distributed along this line. 
In this case, the robot can actually go forward pretty accurately, but has a quite large error in its rotational component. And so the individual terms are Gaussian distributed. That's at least the typical assumption which is done. And then kind of this noise is propagated through the nonlinear functions like sine and cosine, which result from the standard motion equations. And this leads to these type of what we call typically call banana shaped distributions. This is just expressed kind of as a, as a histogram, and this is kind of a sampled representation way to if you kind of start here with whatever 1,000 samples, propagate all those samples with addition with noise terms according to a Gaussian distribution, then you will actually end up with getting these distributions. It's kind of the odometry model. That's kind of the standard model that we will use in most cases in this course. There's a second um, model, which is so-called velocity-based model. And here we assume that the motion command that I sent to the robot, so the motion command u over here, is given by two velocities, a translational velocity and a rotational velocity, which I can command to the system. So that means, given my current state, which I'm, when I'm sitting over here, and I execute a translational rotational velocity, I will actually drive along that arc. And as a result of the standard motion equations, if I assume that for a certain time interval, the translational and the rotational velocity is constant, just for very short time intervals, for this time interval, the robot actually drives on a circular, on a circular arc, so on a circle, or on an arc, because it's not a full circle. And, if I, and then I, the, the typical model assumes that you kind of only have a discrete number of possibilities to change the translation and the rotational velocity, like whatever the clock size, with, uh, clock time with which you can send commands to your, the hardware. Let's say you can do that 500 times per second. So one of these time intervals where the velocity is assumed to be constant is two milliseconds. So you have very, very short, uh, a very, very small number of circular arcs that you attach. Of course, this is not exactly the case because the, the system, the hardware typically doesn't instantly execute the new velocity, so there's some uh, ramping that the kind of velocity slowly increases and then stops at the desired speed. But that's something we assume and uh, we ignore in these models over here. If we do that from the basic motion equation, so it's kind of a twice an integration, um, we actually can end up with this equation. So that's a new state given the old state and um, the, what's, what sits in here is kind of the, uh, that's the orientation of the system. This is the translational velocity, rotational velocity, and this is the, the, the delta t, the time interval. And this gives us a motion on a circular arc. If you now look to this kind of motion model, the velocity-based model, and compare it to the odometry-based model, um, do you see any structural difference? Something which is a little bit weird? Maybe? Yes, please. Sorry? No, no, I, maybe you're on the right track. Just repeat that, I couldn't uh, hear. Um, so we have an orientation in here. This is the, uh, the current orientation of the system. Um, and also in the velocity, we have a rotational velocity over here. Translational rota rotational velocity. But you've, you've been pretty close to the real issue I wanted to point out. No, that's, that should be correct. So this is only holds for the case, I have to say that, where um, the uh, rotational velocity is non-equal to zero. So you get a different equation if the rotational velocity is zero, because then you have a straight line, which is kind of uh, a circular arc with an infin infinite, infinite radius. And then the equation looks different. And then you have the cosine in x and the sine in y, but that's the, the, correct, um, the correct result that you get for the case when omega is unequal to zero. So the, let's give you another hint, hint. So if you compare the two velocity commands, in the first case it was a first rotation, a translation, a second rotation. And in this case we have a translational velocity and a rotational velocity. What's weird about that? Just guess. <laughs> we just have uh, like one information about the changing um, rotation. Yeah, exactly. And so when we end up in that point, we have uh, just one information about our rotation. Can you tell us the final rotation? 
that's the case. So we need, so the thing is, the ones is kind of a um, two degree of freedom. So we have two parameters and one of three parameters. And if you have a robot, let's say, you know, we are in the, so we are currently in that state over here, looking in this direction. If I set the translation and the rotational velocity, we said the robot will move on circular arcs depending on depending on the translation, the ratio of the translation and rotational <coughs> velocity. So if I end up at one of those points over here, I'm constrained in where the robot looks to. So if it ends up in this point, the robot must look in this direction. What happens, however, if I want to express a motion where the robot is sitting here and should be sitting here? So there's no circular arc which connects those, or there's no. The problem is if I just go on a circular arc in this point, the orientation is a different one. So I need to have an additional term which accounts for this kind of final rotation. Because I simply need a third uh, parameter to have this transformation, this three-dimensional space uh, which we are living in. So the mode moves on a circle, or a circular arc actually, um, and this circle constrains the final orientation, and how we can fix this is actually adding an additional parameter which we add to the final rotation. And so if we look to our equations, we just add an additional term over here, which tells us um, how much we kind of rotate in the end in the final rotation. And if we now look to the velocity-based models that we actually obtain over here, they actually look pretty similar from the distributions as the uh, odometry-based models. And this is actually the case. They are quite similar. The only difference, the main difference is that um, the estimates of these velocity commands are typically much more noisy than the information we get from odometry. And therefore, the odometry system is to be more accurate because the information we have, kind of the, the counting of the revolutions of the wheels, gives us a more precise information than the executed velocities. But the motions that you can see here look very, very similar to the motions we have seen before. Okay, is at that point any question about these motions, about these motion models? Okay, perfect. So let's, not, let's look to the next model, the sensor model. This was the second important term that we are using here. And this sensor model obviously depends on your sensor. So a laser range finder, which is a sensor which gives you the distance to the closest obstacle in a certain direction. Um, is something completely different than a camera, for example, or whatever, a radar. So the sensor model strongly depends on the sensor we are using. In the beginning of the course, we will look here into laser-based systems. So we assume we have a laser rangefinder and we can measure in a certain angle the distance to the closest obstacle. And therefore, the models I present here are models for laser rangefinders. Um, as the course evolves, we will also look into different sensors, um, we have bearing-only sensors, which only measure the orientation, just cameras, for example. And depending on how much time we have, I would also look into a kind of Kinect-based sensors, which gives us an image as well as a depth information, 3D information, which is kind of, kind of new in robotics or started over the past few years, and, but changed the field in robotics quite substantially. Therefore, it's kind of worth at least reporting a little bit about how, uh, the, how to use this sensor in order to do, to do mapping and build maps. But for the beginning now, for today, we assume we have a laser rangefinder. And this laser rangefinder um, typically has um, a mirror which is rotating, kind of 45 uh, degree mirror, and it rotates like this. There's kind of a laser sitting over here. So the laser is reflected by the mirror. And then it's a time of flight sensor which measures the time it needs to send out the signal and receive the signal back because there's also a receiver sitting in here. And then this mirror is rotating, so I get at very short time intervals um, proximity measurements at different um, angular orientations. So, for example, it starts here, this measurement number one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, to 180, for example. Okay, and these are kind of measurements. So, a sensor scan, ZT, consists of K beams, what we call a beam measurements. These are kind of the individual measurements um, of sending out laser pulse and waiting um, until we receive that pulse. And um, so every measurement is kind of, an, in this case, k-dimensional vector of proximity measurements. And by knowing the position of the mirror, I can estimate which, um, in which orientation this 
uh, laser beam was sent out. And a standard assumption that's what most models do in robotics, they assume that these beams are independent of each other. But whatever it means. Um, if I know what the environment looks like and if I know where the sensor is, what I measure in, in this direction is independent from what I measure in this direction. Again, this is an assumption. I don't, I don't state that this is exactly like that. Actually, there are, you can actually show that this is not exactly the case. There, there is a dependency. Um, but this is kind of a standard assumption that is done. That means the probability distribution about the, over the whole scan, so that T, which consists of K beams, is the product of the probability distribution of the individual beams. And then this model here just looks in the um, what the probability of measuring something in one direction, given I know where I am and given I know what the world looks like. And there are different ways now for describing this quantity. So it's kind of the beam-based model. The most simplest example of those models is the so-called um, end beam endpoint model. Um, if you have, if this is what your environment looks like, this is where the robot, uh, the position of the robot, this is the measurement it takes, so it got kind of measured this distance in this direction. Then the endpoint model says, okay, I'm ignoring what, what the map information along that, um, along that line. I'm just look to the, to the endpoint of that beam, therefore it's also called beam endpoint model, and just look how far is this point away from the closest obstacle. So here, there's actually no obstacle in the surrounding, so this measurement should have a very, very low likelihood. Um, if the beam would end up here, an obstacle is actually really close nearby, that would get a much higher value. And the reason why people use this model, although it kind of it's, um, from the physics point of view, it's, it's, it's stupid, because there may be a wall over here where the beam can never pass through. So checking what, if there's an obstacle in the map at this, this position is completely nonsense because the beam cannot pass through that wall. So from a physics perspective, this model is not really a good idea, but it works surprisingly well in practice. This is one thing, and the second thing is that um, it's extremely efficient to compute, and that's the main reason why people started using it. Because what you, would need to, what you need to do is, if you have your map, you just kind of need to expand your obstacles a little bit, or kind of, it's a kind of, actually it's a convolution, so it's like um, a Gaussian blur around your obstacles. So you kind of expand these obstacles um, with, the de with the decreasing function. So if, for example, if you have a 1D map, um, so this is x, um, and let's say this part is occupied, so this is occupied with probability 1, occupied with probability 0, that's kind of the standard map. If you convolve it or expand it, it can, you may have Gaussian function with a Gaussian kernel, which looks like this, and you get this value. So the, the further you're away from the obstacle, the smaller the value, the closer you are, the larger the value. And you can compute this very, very effectively. And then the only thing you need to do, you just need to look up in your array at the computed endpoint and take out this value, and you're done. So it's very efficient. It's just a lookup in a map. Um, so that's typical. Uh, map, how it looks like, so this is the, the regular map, so white is free space, um, black is obstacles, it's a typical occupancy grid map that people use. You can turn that into this so-called likelihood field, um, so the, the brighter the values, the higher the probability, um, and then you, if, if a beam ends, for example, up in this white area, this corresponds to that wall, you will get a high value, and here in the middle you get a low, low value. So it's kind of standard, the standard beam endpoint model. Very simple to compute very efficient, um, but yeah, physically not perfectly motivated. Um, there's another model, which is a raycast model, which is also frequently used. It's more expensive to compute, um, but it's physically more accurate. Um, so, and here, let's say I assume, according to my map, here where the star is, there's an obstacle. So what's the likelihood that I measure uh, a certain length, given I know there's an obstacle, let's say, four meter away. It turns out you get kind of this kind of funny looking distribution, which is actually a sum of four different distributions, which cover four typical facts that can occur. 
Again, these are modeling design decisions, modeling assumptions, that we use kind of four distributions to model that. But if you actually look to the data that you get, you can actually see that this resembles the reality quite well. This consists of kind of, as I said, four components. The first component is kind of a Gaussian distribution around the, uh, the, the position of the real obstacle. So if I'm, the obstacle is according to my map four meter away, I measure in this direction, I will get a Gaussian distribution around four meter of what I measure, which is kind of your measurement noise that your sensor has. Then there is a component which, is an, which is an ex, describes an exponential decay, which is this part over here. And this allows us to cover um, dynamic obstacles which walk around, like people walking around in the environment, other robots driving around. And those dynamic obstacles only affect the probability distribution up to the, the point where I see the, where the obstacle is. Because whatever walks behind my obstacle, I don't care, because um, the obstacle will reflect the, the sensor measurement. It's kind of an exponential decay here. This peak there in the back is something which is, is due to the physical limitations of your sensor. That's a sensor has a certain um, maximum measurement range, and it's called a max range reading. So if you have, if your sensor measures only four meters and the obstacle is five meters away, you will get no information, no return. And there's often the max range reading, which is expressed like this. It's kind of a truncated maximum value. And then you have kind of a uniform distribution um, about the whole space, which is something something I haven't covered yet, some random effect, something I really don't know what happened. It's just kind of very small uniform distribution. And then if you sum all these four up, these four distributions, you will end up with a system which looks like this. Again, the frequently used model in robotics and it's kind of physically more plausible than the beam endpoint model. It's more expensive to compute because you have to do ray casting operations in your map, therefore it's also called ray casting or ray cast model, but it's physically more plausible so it should actually give you better results. And the final model I want to quickly look into is a model for perceiving landmarks, distinct landmarks in the environment with a range bearing sensor, like a laser range finder, which gives you a range in the bearing, so kind of the orientation and the distance. And um, we're just looking into landmarks, so something I can identify in the environment, like typical landmarks used in robotics could be whatever your corners in indoor environments. So you extract corners from your range scan, say, okay, that's a unique landmark, there's a corner, and your map says, okay, at this position, there's a corner. And you can identify the corner in your range scan, you know where the corner is in your map, and then you can actually compute what's the likelihood of measuring the corner um, at that certain position. And um, the, the assumption, that, so, okay, let, let's go to the details here. R is the, 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 the range reading, the, pro, the, the distance that was measured by the laser range scanner. And phi here is the, um, the orientation of the beam with respect to the heading of the robot. So because the laser range finder has this rotating mirror, so it measures uh, in this direction, this, 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 and this is expressed by this phi over here. We know that the robot is, or we assume to know that the robot is at x, y, theta, and we are observing some feature, some landmark j in the environment, and the location according to the map is mjx, mjy, so the x and y coordinate of that landmark. That can be the corner. It could also be whatever the door frame, if I'm, my landmarks are door frames. Or if I'm outside, outdoors, and I um, estimate the position of trees, the trunk of the tree is a feature. And then, again, what I should measure in terms of um, distance is just the distance of the feature and the robot in X and in Y squared, summed up, and taking the square root. So this Euclidean distance between the position of the robot and where this this feature should be, and the orientation is given by the, uh, again, by, eight, by the eight-ton function um, minus the orientation of the robot. So it's very similar to the rotation, uh, translation rotation model, just that I observe only a point in space. Plus some noise, this can be Gaussian noise, so that would be kind of the mean of what you expect to measure, and again, you have a measurement noise, which is often assumed to be Gaussian. Doesn't need to be Gaussian, um, depending on the properties of your sensor, Bearing may be more accurate than range or the other way around. That just depends on your sensor information. But that's kind of the, one of the easiest models you can use for perceiving landmarks. So they're kind of three different things. If you have kind of dense maps, then you can take, for example, here the beam endpoint model or this ray cast model. And if you work with landmarks, that's kind of the standard model that you use. And given those models, you can realize um, base filters, for example, to 
perform localization to estimate where the robot is. So we have this odometry based model. We can estimate where the robot goes if I execute a command. Given I have a map of the environment, let's say a map of landmarks, and I know where those landmarks are, I can say, okay, the robot is at a certain point, it's a certain position. What's the likelihood of observing whatever that tree, which is there standing outside there in front of our building, um, at a distance of 20 meters and at an orientation of whatever 20 degrees? If I have that information, I can compute the observation likelihood of the observation model. And from the odometry information, I have the motion model. And then I can just implement a base filter and get a recursive estimate of where the robot is. It's kind of localization. We will do that for SLAM. That's something we will start with next week. So um, to, to sum that up, what, what this lecture should be about is was kind of a short repetition of the base filter, or actually a short derivation, because the base filter itself is not that complicated. That's really the full derivation of the base filter. That's all the magic behind it that you have seen here in the first, whatever, 20 minutes of the lecture today. And that the recursive framework for state estimation and, um, but it leaves you open a lot of design decisions, how to implement your probability distributions, what kind of models you allow for. The only, the only thing it requires you is to specify two models. This is the motion model and the observation model. Of course, these are essential quantities in these equations. And I, then in the second part of this lecture, quickly um, went through typical motions and observation models. So that was um, the odometry based model, velocity based model, uh, for the motion model and um, a standard beam endpoint model, ray cast model uh, for laser range finders as well as a model for perceiving landmarks in the environment. If you want to know more about that or that it was still not enough, on the base filter itself there's a second chapter in the probabilistic robotics books which revisits this. It's kind of similar to what I've shown here and there's also chapter 5 in introduction to mobile robotics which is pretty similar to what we've shown here. A little bit Maybe it took a little bit longer there to derive it, provide a little bit more details, but actually I think all the key essence that you will need here um, what is what's presented today. And if you want to know more about motion and observation models, there's again chapter 5 and 6 in the Probabilistic Robotics book, or chapter 6 and 7 in the Introduction to Mobile Robotics course taught last summer term. And video recordings are available for these course as well. So if you feel still uncomfortable, you think you still missed something, um, it may be a good idea to either watch the videos of the course, but they are not too dramatically different from what I told you because I was also involved in teaching this course, um, I then probably would recommend you to look into the probabilistic robotics book. Uh, I just checked the library, there should be 12 copies available, so enough, I guess, for this course. And um, so you can actually revisit this concept. Um, maybe the book explains it better than I did it, I don't know, uh, you can judge yourself. Okay, that's it for the first hour. Thanks so far, and we will just continue in a few seconds with the excellent comment filter. I just think we make a five-minute break, open the windows, and then we can continue. Thanks.